Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Department of Chemistry of the University of Peradeniya and the team Inspire, it's a pleasure for me to welcome all of you to the 12th episode of the Inspire webinar series. The intention of this webinar series is to help our students to discover the hidden scientists in them. So with that intention, uh, we have invited Professor Claudio Verney from the Wayne State University, USA to share his research knowledge and experience with us. I was informed that his students are also joining uh, today. So I warmly welcome all of you to the 12th Inspire webinar. I now invite Professor Manavadevi Ganehenage, the head of the Department of Chemistry to introduce the speaker. Thank you, Dr. Dimanti Udwala. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, in this evening from Sri Lanka, I'm really excited to introduce Professor Claudio Verani, the invited speaker of Inspire webinar today. I'm pleased to say that uh, our invited speaker is uh, not a visitor, uh, either to me or to many of our former students who pursued uh, their PhD from Wayne State University, USA. I met Professor Verani for the first time at the University of Manchester, United Kingdom at uh, ISAC Inorganic Conference held in 2017. From that meetup, I got to know uh, he was the supervisor of uh, Dr. Danuska Ekanayaka, who was one of my undergraduate research students. Uh, since then, we became friends and uh, he helped me get in the teaching positions at Wayne State when I was there in 2018 on my sabbatical visit. So let me brief his background. Uh, Professor Verani comes from a background of being a superintendent and a highly reputed academic institutions in uh, several countries, including Brazil, Germany, and uh, the USA, and uh, serves at present at Wayne State University, USA, not only to help improve students' engagement and uh, academic activities, but also to uplift the high quality research in the area of inorganic chemistry and the material science. So uh, Professor Claudio Verani got his MSc in 1997 at the Universidad Federal de Santa Catarina in Brazil. His PhD came from the Max Planck Institute for Bioinorganic Chemistry and uh, Ruhr Universität Bochum in Germany, where he developed experimental models to understand magnetic coupling in heteronuclear species. Then he moved to US in uh, 2000 for postdoctoral work at the Johns Hopkins University, where he carried out research on modeling aspects of dioxygen activation by cytochrome C oxidase. Uh, he moved to Wayne State in 2002 and uh, at Wayne State, he promoted to uh, an associate professor in 2008 and to a professor in 2013. Since uh, 2017, he's also serving as an associate dean for research at the Wayne State College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. So as an academic, Professor Verani has been active as an administrator as well as a supervisor. So uh, he has advised many PhD candidates, postdoctoral fellows and numerous undergraduates. As you watched from the video clip a few minutes ago, he has received many prestigious awards from Brazil, Germany and the USA for both research and teaching during his academic career. Uh, the Verani group is uh, invested in the development of new concepts in molecular electronics. His research is built on the fundamentals of trans and metal chemistry. In his talk today, he will discuss the methodology, experimental work, and uh, intricate mechanistic insights obtained for several electronic configurations that uh, display rectification. He will brush up your knowledge on uh, electronic configurations, coordination numbers, redox behavior of metals, ligand, and molecular orbital theory and uh, you can enjoy the ride. I'm proud to say several talented Sri Lankan students seeking the opportunity of a PhD degree under his mentorship have greatly helped in the development of his uh, research. I know some of his students are among the Inspire audience today, so you are all are welcome. 
So in this evening, he will tell their success stories along with the science, coupled with an uh, impressive background. It is not therefore surprising that he became a devoted and renowned scientist in the USA. No matter how busy his academic life is, he never postponed finding a free time for his family. Especially, he enjoys the company of his wife, daughter, and dog, and uh, tries to play music and reads about uh, archaeology, history, and politics. So, uh, after all, our invited speaker, Professor Verani, today is a living inspiration to both the student and the staff here. Uh, once again, as a member and the head of the department of Department of Chemistry, University of Peradeniya, I am honored to host Professor Claudio Verani as the invited speaker of our Inspire webinar. With that, I ask that you give your full attention to Professor Claudio Verani. And please join me in welcoming Professor Claudio to the Inspire stage. It's over to you, Claudio. Thank you, David. Thank you so much for this invitation. I'm really, uh, without words, it's, it's, it's been wonderful. Um, it's a good morning for me. I know it's almost good night for you. And I appreciate the flexibility with time. We, we then had an extra surprise that uh, we have time change here. <laughs> so I'm very, very happy that this is happening. Okay, and I will try to um, give a broader perspective about what we have been doing in terms of research, but also trying to go a little bit beyond science and um, discuss a few things, discuss a little bit of dreams, right? Can uh, it, it, several students at this point are thinking about a possible graduate career, academic career, um, should they be doing that? And I, I, I would say yes, and I will try to substantiate that with a few examples and a few um, a brief presentation about uh, what Wayne State is, what, how I found my way, and then we'll talk science. Okay, and I will certainly show the contribution of many um, former and present Sri Lankan students in my lab that ultimately that is the main objective in my career is, is the mentoring um, of new talent so that they can actually do better and, 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 and have a fulfilling life, okay? Uh, I will share my screen now. And I think it is on, right? Yes, you can see. Okay, excellent. So I, um, I want to start by dissecting the title here and, and, and telling you what we will be talking about today. And as the title suggests, we are interested in transporting electrons. And this transport happens between two electrodes that are kind of sandwiched between with something in between. And this something is a new class of molecules called metallosurfactants. So all in all, we are following electrons going from one electrode to another electrode in these constructs called junctions, in these devices called junctions. And we will discuss the synthesis of the compounds, the building of these junctions and then the analysis of their behavior. As I promised Devi, there's a lot of ligand field theory. There's a lot of uh, fundamental coordination chemistry that is well established. And what we are trying to do is to take this field using the fundamental tenets of this field and bring it to, um, other fronts, like other applications, different behaviors, trying to do to accomplish something for science. Of course, what we do is a very small thing. 
And we need to keep in, in mind that um, it is really like ants work. It's a little contribution to the, to the big building of science. So let me start by thanking Devi again. It was a very kind, uh, a very kind invitation. Um, Melanie Thomas as well, she took care of a lot of details. And um, both Melanie and, and, and Devi had their PhDs at, Wayne, at, at uh, the United States. Devi actually got her PhD at Wayne State. And that's exactly where I want to start. It's just like a brief discussion, like a two or three slides on what Wayne State is about. And uh, we are in the northern border with Canada. So a little bit colder than Sri Lanka probably, but not by much with global warming. And then um, we are in Detroit. Detroit is in the Wayne County. And that's why the name of the university is Wayne State University. The state is because there are no federally funded universities like in Sri Lanka. In the US you have either state or, or private universities. We have two classifications that we are very proud of. One of them is the high community engagement. That means um, Wayne State is committed to working with the Detroit community. We are part of the community. There are no walls separating the university from the city and we are very proud to be Detroit. The other one is very significant for what I do. That is a R1 uh, classification from the Carnegie Foundation. The Carnegie Foundation is the sheriff in terms of the quality of universities in the US. And they consider Wayne State as very high research activity. That's, that's the top uh, level for um, research universities. We have about 27,000 faculty. We have about 25,000 students. Um, who, uh, 300 plus academic programs and the university as a whole operates a budget of about $630 million. So it's a good operation. Uh, it's a beautiful campus. Chemistry itself is housed in this beautiful building that was completely renovated in 2012. We have about uh, 3,700 square meters of space. And, and beautiful labs that don't look this clean anymore, but they are still very functional and, and very uh, up to date. Uh, we have meeting rooms and we also have in this area here, you, you can see my cursor when I move my cursor around my screen, right? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Uh, so this part here is actually the lecture hall that is dedicated to chemistry exclusively. Um, about 30 faculty, about 130 graduate students, 30 postdocs in all areas. And um, we also have top-notch facilities in the Lumogen Instrument Center, in which we have a lab for NMR and EPR, microscopy and, and X-ray crystallography, mass spectrometry, and, and, and many other facilities that actually allow us to do a lot of the heavy lifting, a lot of the heavy uh, instrumentation just right right there. Uh, students have direct access to all of these labs. They get training. It's a very good opportunity for all of us. If by any chance anybody is interested in a PhD program, uh, please uh, contact Federico Rabuffetti. This is the email that you should use, or just drop me an email. I'm easy to find. Competitive stipends that will not make you rich, but certainly will make you live re relatively well during your PhD uh, career. And then just before we start talking about hardcore science, about all of what, the, all the things that I've promised we will cover today, I wanted to, um, to a certain point, repeat what Devi mentioned in the beautiful uh, movie before we started, and just tell you, so if you ask yourself, can, can I dream big? Can I actually, you know, 
should I risk, should I do something bold or will I be burnt? That's the big question that we always have, right? I, I asked myself that question many times. And the truth is most of the times it worked. A few times I got burnt and so is life. We need to take risks to get something. And in my particular case, um, you're right here. And I was born in a small town south of Brazil called Orleans. Actually, in Portuguese, you would call that Orleans, but that's a different thing. And what happened here is that uh, early on, I moved to a technical uh, high school. Um, now that I have a 17-year-old daughter, I realize what I asked my parents when I wanted to leave home at age 15. Uh, they agreed somehow, and I never regretted that. Um, but so I, I moved to this school that was uh, teaching chemistry in the morning, in the afternoon, and then at night. And I've learned a great deal of chemistry there. By the time that I went to my undergraduate studies, I went to the Federal University of Santa Catarina. Uh, I spent a wonderful undergrad there doing both research and taking classes. Uh, undergraduate research is something that is absolutely important because it really prepares uh, students to do much better if they decide to go for uh, graduate studies. And even when they decide to find a job after graduation, they have just so much more experience with that. From there, I did my master's and opportunities appeared. Of course, some planned, some dug, and some uh, by chance that I could go to Germany to do my PhD work. Went to Germany, learned German, uh, interacted with a lot of interesting people in there. And by the time that I was ready, I was actually planning to go back to Brazil and find an academic position. But um, at the time, all the positions for federal universities where research is done in Brazil, they were closed. And then more or less by chance, a little bit by desire, a little bit by chance, I decided to go for a postdoc. And this postdoc was at Johns Hopkins University here in the US. From there, as they say, the rest is history. I've applied for positions and I got um, and I, and I got accepted at Wayne State. So I've been here for about 19 years, what is a pretty long time. It doesn't really feel that long to me, um, but I had opportunity to do two things that I really like. Uh, at the very bottom of my heart, I'm a researcher. I like research. I like... Um, I like to be in, in contact with students, to be advising, mentoring, sometimes, very often, confusing my students as well with some ideas and, 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 and crazy propositions about what to do in the lab. And in the end, they graduate, find jobs, and um, it, it's very fulfilling to me. The other thing that I do, I'm associate dean for research. This is a nice picture that we took in a trip to China a few years ago, so that we go between very formal to less formal to completely informal, depending on the day. Um, the bottom line is I'm a regular person. And if I was able to do that, if I was able to, to, to get, you know, to accomplish things that were important to me, so can anybody do. Um, and at the very core of that is planning, hard work, and grit, and a lot of persistence because it's not always flowers, and then also a little bit of luck because um, there are several things that we can plan and persist on, and then there are several things that just happen. And you know, a good door opens and you just enter in that room and you see what happens. Um, I think it's absolutely fundamental that you pay a lot of attention to quality, to the details. You know, one of the things that I that I tell my my students when we are having group meetings is like, well, the drawing of this molecule is not completely symmetrical, and what that means is you're not paying enough attention 
to the details. Those are very important. They are a reflection of what we are doing of our work. Um, if you think about an academic life, you should certainly have a love for research and even more important, a love for problem solving, right? More and more when you have, say, a PhD degree, if you not necessarily stay in academia in your own field, you will get a job in, say, industry. And what is really important is that what you do is you're a problem solver. You apply the skills that you developed in a PhD program and in, a, in an undergrad program and in a PhD program, and you solve problems. So that's what this is about. And also very important, uh, commitment to innovative thinking. What, what do I mean with that? Uh, I mean that you need to always question what you're doing. You find solutions. I just told you, you need to be a problem solving person. A problem solver finds a solution, uses that solution, and from time to time rethinks what that solution is and tries to find something better. Sometimes it's just an incremental change that will get to better results. Sometimes it's starting from scratch, something completely new, trying to find a solution for a given problem. And if you do that, uh, like one of my students would say, the sky is the limit. You're young and beautiful and just go for it. So uh, one thing that I want to say and that I'm very, very proud is that I had along the way several Sri Lankan students that absolutely, completely, totally played the most fundamental role in the development of the research that I was, um, that I was doing. And, and again, research is not something that is, that is one-sided. The original ideas might start with me, but if I'm working with students that are not contributing their own ideas to the project, I wouldn't go very far. So I'm very proud to say that uh, my, my first Sri Lankan student was Dakshika Vanyarachi. Uh, she graduated in 2013. She's a senior lecturer at Sri uh, Jaya Vardhanipura, and she's doing quite well there. And she worked with water oxidation. In this picture, um, Dakshika is celebrating their orals with Lanka. And Lanka Vikramasinghe was another excellent student. You will see Lanka's name coming several times today because she was actually the, the powerhouse behind rectification, behind uh, directional electron transport. She is in this picture with Sunali Gonawala. Lanka right now is a senior scientist at Solvay in Texas, and she's doing very, very well for herself. And Sunali, she graduated in 2016. She took from where Lanka left, and then she gave her own contribution by transferring that knowledge towards corrosion inhibition, use of films for corrosion inhibition. So again, each of these three students, they gave very specific contributions, right? The idea came from proposals, from discussions, et cetera, et cetera, started with me, but they themselves were very creative and very good problem solvers. Uh, Sonali right now lives in Australia. She is a research chemist at Kinos. And then uh, another person that was in my group and graduated in 2018 is Pavitra Kankanamalage. Uh, Pavitra worked with water reduction. She was um, the pioneer of using nickel in our lab nickel for hydrogen generation and for photochemical hydrogen generation. She uh, graduated in 2018, 
left for a postdoc, and right now she is at a second postdoc at Argon National Labs in Chicago, where uh, this is a kind of a PDF position that you, you start as PDF and you end up staying there as a um, um, staff researcher. So she's doing well. Then, of course, not unknown from this crowd here is Danushka Ekaniaki. Danushka started at the same time as um, Pavitra, and he got a tough project. Boy, I feel sorry sometimes because we agreed that he would try to develop to develop um, catalysts based on copper. But copper, because of Jan Teller distortion and because of a lot of liability, decomposes very easily. He published several beautiful papers. He's doing well at, uh, as a uh, postdoc at Marquette right now. And soon enough, he will find a job and, and go on with his career that has been very impressive. The next person that I think is in the audience is uh, Isuri Viraratni. Isuri, what she did was uh, she uh, also took where Lanka had left and she said, well, sure, we can do rectifiers, but what if we start playing with the electronic configuration of these compounds? And we discovered new mechanisms. We went through great lengths. She also worked on uh, what Sunali had started and worked on corrosion, has beautiful works. And not only she did that work, but she also moved corrosion towards aluminum surfaces. What, again, that was not easy. Uh, Isuri graduated just early this year and she's on the market in Sri Lanka. And if you're looking for a good person, she's your person. So the last person that I want to acknowledge is still at the lab. It's an almost doctor person and that's Samudra Murugama. She's also coming from uh, your university and uh, she's very shy, difficult to take a very good picture of her. But here we are in one, before COVID, we used to go to bars and restaurants, not bars, but restaurants with the group all the time. And of course, all of that has stopped right now. But Samudra is working with beautiful projects on rectification, rethinking completely the way that we're doing that. And this is just a picture, a recent picture of the group in which we are all uh, celebrating uh, Gutenberg. And that is one of the statues that we have on campus. So. Having introduced that, again, it's very important for me to have this large number of very talented students, and all of them coming from Sri Lanka is a particular uh, privilege for me. Let's just start talking about science, and I just want to tell you current research, I mentioned that Dakshika, Pavitra, and Danushka, they were working with catalysis. We spend a lot of time synthesizing different catalysts so that we can foster water splitting, that is the conversion of water into oxygen and hydrogen. This is not the topic for today. And if at any point, Devi, you want me to come back and speak about um, catalysis, I will be more than happy to do so. The other thing that we do in the lab is the, the research on redox responsive metallosurfactants. We started with the idea that we would take some uh, coordination compounds, we would decorate the ligands with either long alkyl chain or alkoxy chains, make them amphiphilic, meaning half soluble in water, half insoluble in water, behaving like surfactants, and that leads us to three different uh, areas in here. That is uh, corrosion mitigation that I mentioned. Um, metal recovery by ion flotation is a brand new thing that we are starting because again, um, rolling stones gather no moss and it's good to have no moss. And today I want to discuss molecular rectification, okay? So everything started when I, uh, with a bioinorganic inspiration, I had the privilege to be mentored by 
some giants of the bioinorganic field, starting with my master's advisor in Brazil, Ademir Neves, going to Germany, Carl Vickert, Fogoni Choudhury, and then when I came to the US with Ken Kylie. So all of these people, what they do is uh, they try to understand what enzymes do. Well, in that line, when I started my independent research, I was still thinking as a bioinorganic chemist, and I was fascinated by a recent structure that had been solved of tyrosine hydroxylase. Uh, what this, what this uh, enzyme has that is unique is its coordination site. An iron center is coordinated to two nitrogens and three oxygens. So two nitrogens from histidines and three oxygens, two from water, one from a, a glucose. Uh, glucose, glue, whatever. Uh, so this is a five coordinate iron center. Iron as a 3D5 ion wants to be six coordinate so that you can is spread, you can have one electron per molecular orbital. And the fact that this active center is five coordinate explains some unique reactivity, like what is needed for the synthesis of catecholamines, that they are adding this OH group, forming a catechol group here. And what they are doing is basically these enzymes are handling radicals. So very resilient. And that to me was kind of light bulb. Um, what we have then is iron, five coordinates, two nitrogens, three oxygens. And then we are moving away from the octahedral field that we expect to see iron in, T2, G, E, G, 3D5, one electron in each of these orbitals. And we go to fields that are five coordinate, like 3D age and C4V symmetry, in which now we have different distributions of energies. And that ends up being very important for what we want to do. Uh, very important here, whenever we go from octahedral to square pyramidal, you see we are taking the lowest lying orbitals and we're bringing them even lower. That means we are lowering their energy. And that ends up being one of the key things for what we want to do and what we end up doing. So if I want to summarize what happened in this direction, uh, a lot more has happened, but what happened with this kind, this train of thought in my career, uh, I would start saying that we, we, in the beginning, were thinking about electronic structure, very bioinorganic oriented. We synthesized the ligand platform that has two nitrogens and three oxygens, pretty much like the enzyme. So modeling, bioinorganic modeling. But soon enough, came Lanka with some ideas. Actually, I had proposed to functionalize this molecule into a surfactant. And again, ideas take some time. It requires the right time, the right person. And Lanka was the right person to do that. She functionalized these compounds in a way that she then developed either the equivalent compounds that now are amphiphilic, they are surfactants, or she simplified the design, still keeping this five coordination so that we could check several uh, electronic structures. From there, we went to uh, films for corrosion mitigation. Again, Sonali, Isuri have done this work. We took this same ligand replaced by cobalt and we were able to establish proton reduction, formation of hydrogen, and from there, we move to water oxidation. Um, the, the, the formation of hydrogen has two sub-reactions. One of them is the most important because it forms hydrogen. But before that, we have a step that involves four electrons and is the most difficult of those steps. And that's what we were trying to study here. And then finally, we got to water reduction. So for today, I really want, I, I certainly have no time to discuss all of that. And I want to focus on this little story here about the use of diodes or molecular rectifiers for current rectification. Uh, I will use several names that are absolute synonyms like diodes, rectifiers, and rectification means directional electron transport. 
elections go in a certain direction, but don't come back. Okay, so uh, let's check that. Again, it's a story that involves several people. Um, it, everybody in this picture here has done extremely well and they are up to greater things. Uh, and it's a very international group. Mauricio Lansnaster was Brazilian. Marco was Canadian. Um, Lanka, Sunali, and Isuri are Sri Lankan. So it's the beauty of diversity. So going to molecular electronics, the idea is that we want to replace traditional silicon components by molecular components, either because silicon components will get to a point that they emit so much heat that they start melting the motherboard, or because we want to find alternative ways to do computing, you know, the binary computing, yes and no, or zeros and ones. So we, in the end, what we want, if we want to have a molecular computer, we need wires that are conductors, we need logic gates, we need switches, amplifiers, memory elements, resistors, capacitors, transistors, and each of these molecules would need to have a certain behavior. We also need rectifiers or diodes. In the end, what we are doing is we are trying to control electron transport in several different ways, either by transmitting the electrons or by stopping the transmission of those electrons or by sending those electrons in a specific direction. That's where we are. So the idea of molecular diodes and molecular rectification is again, trying to find replacement substitutes for this little diode here. If you ever cracked a computer open and checked how it looks inside, you will see several of these uh, black components. What they do is they are kind of a gate. Uh, if you have a regular uh, wire saying you can have electrons flowing from the top to the bottom or from the bottom to the top, and that would be represented in a, a current potential curve as a behavior like this sigmoidal shape here. You can go, you apply a voltage and you have electrons flowing. You invert the signal, the sign of that current and you have electrons flowing in another direction. When you put one of these gates here, one of these diodes, what you see is a curve that looks like this. You apply a certain voltage, say negative, you see electrons flowing in a certain direction. But when you apply a positive voltage, you don't actually see the electrons coming back. That is absolutely fundamental for any logic operation that we want to do in a computer. The idea of using molecules started a while ago in 1974. Um, in fact, I wasn't conscientious enough to even understand that. I was a baby. And the idea was coming from two very, very smart people, Avron and Ratner, working at IBM here in the United States. Early on, I mean, computers were not even a thing and they were already thinking about what's the next step. Remember that I told you, you need to always be creative, think outside of the box, uh, problem solving, et cetera, et cetera. That's what they did. It's like, we don't really have laptops or not even personal computers in 1974, but hey, let's think what is possible. Thinking is one thing. Realizing is a very different thing. And Avron and Ratner, they were theoretician, uh, the, uh, theoretical chemists, theoreticians, and they proposed that gold molecule, gold junction that we will talk about today. So electron, there's a molecule in between and another electrode. And if this molecule has an acceptor moiety and has a donor moiety, well, an electron could come, could be injected to the molecule, tunnel through the molecule to reach the donor, and then the donor would give off one extra electron. So the electron leaves this electrode and ends in this electrode. So all of that is beautiful, but all of that was actually an ansatz. A, uh, a, it's a, an interesting word in German to describe that you actually thought of the problem, but you didn't solve the problem. The problem would be solved only 20 years later 
when Ashwell and Sambles and Metzger uh, explore this molecule. The molecule itself looks very different from this one, but it's pretty much the same. You have a donor part, you have a bridge, and you have an acceptor part. So donor, bridge, acceptor. Put it in between electrodes, and they demonstrated clearly that this is, in fact, a rectifier. What does that mean? Electrons go in this direction, but they don't go, they don't return. So this kind of curve here. And this is Robert Metzger, the recently visited Wayne State. I invited him to come. You will see him in this talk again briefly. So if I wanted to tell you, if, 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 we were to have this elevator pitch, you know, this possibility of telling everything that you need to tell in 30 seconds or so. This would be my elevator pitch. What we do in my group is we synthesize interesting molecules. They are here. We analyze those molecules like using the most traditional coordination chemistry, electrochemistry, spectroscopy, infrared, UV visible, elemental analysis, crystal structure. Then we make films of these molecules and we make films on top of electrodes. And then we make devices or junctions. And that's how we get this gold molecule gold device or junction. Another uh, other two words that are synonym in my talk, junction and device, okay? So then we measure this IV behavior, the current by potential behavior that I described, and we try to explain the mechanisms. That's it, that's what we do. So if we take these molecules, we have an electron that starts on one electrode, we have a molecule that usually is neutral, and then we transfer this electron to the molecule. Now we have a hole in the electrode, an electron in the molecule, and an unchanged second electrode. And then we transfer this, we transport this electron to the second electrode. Then we have hole, ground state or fundamental state molecule is reaccessed and we trans have transported this electron. When we do that, we see the curve that we want to see. So to do this work, we've synthesized quite a number of different um, ligands and very important for this talk are four of them the two original compounds that we've synthesized looking for properties and the two original compounds that we synthesized so that they have amphiphilic properties. So let's see what happens there. For those two original compounds, uh, Mauricio Lanznaster and Marco Allard, they were working on the full characterization, electrochemistry, spectroscopy, um, crystal structure. You see these two crystal structures, they are related to very similar compounds. One of them is an amine, so protonated nitrogen. One of them is an imine, so double bond. And they look very similar. And they show an iron center that is coordinated to two nitrogens and coordinated to three oxygens that belong to phenolate groups. Same thing goes here. We change a little bit the bond length, but it's basically unchanged. Five coordinate iron, N2O3 environment, phenolates that can be oxidized and form phenoxyl species. So you're in the game. Then comes Lanka, functionalizes these ligands and develops two compounds. One of them is a hydrophobe. It's not a surfactant because it really does not have a, a hydrophobic or a, a water soluble portion. This is water insoluble, this is water insoluble. So it floats on water. And then she also developed an amphiphile or surfactant with these alkoxy groups in which we have a hydrophilic part, 
This part is soluble in water, and this part is insoluble in water. So now we can form films. That's the idea here. We want to form films because our devices need organization. They can't have randomly oriented molecules. And that was the approach that we have used. Uh, she took the electrochemistry of these compounds. They behave pretty much like the previous compounds that we had. This is an iron three to iron two process. And this is the first phenolate going to phenoxyl, second phenolate, third phenolate. Three radical species being formed here, one metal oxidation, excuse me, metal reduction. So what are the observations that we have? Reduction here is really on the metal. It's all metal based. Uh, we don't see formation of iron four. So no high, high valent iron four observed here. We know that the, each of these three phenolate groups can be oxidized. So oxidations are all on the ligand. Reduction on the metal, oxidation on the ligand. And then we hypothesize that if these molecules are ever to become rectifiers, the acceptor moiety would be metal-based. So the LUMO, lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, would be metal-based. The donor should be the ligand and would be housing the highest occupied molecular orbital. Everything is fine. Everything is beautiful. But there is a little problem in there. And I will get to that in a second. How do we take these molecules here and how do we make them uh, into films? We use a method that is called isothermal compression to get Langmuir budget films. Isuri, Lanka, Sonali, they were all experts in this methodology. And what we do is the following. Uh, you see this white part here. This is Teflon. This is a little trough, a little pool filled with water. And then we have a well here that it's not quite visible, but we have a solid substrate that gets dipped in the, in the well. So it is completely immersed in water. Then we come with our molecules, we spread the molecules at the surface of water, and that's why we need them to be surfactants, because they can not sink, they can't solubilize, they need to be be occupying. And by consequence, we go from a very randomly oriented set of molecules to a more oriented, organized set of molecules. It gets to a point that all of these molecules are in their best orientation, best organization. And at this point, what we do is we pull the solid substrate out of water and we transfer this the blue compound forming a film. This is all cool, but how do we know that this is happening? Well, because we do follow a graph that plots surface pressure in millinewtons per meter by the average molecular area. And we see that as we start compression, the average molecular area decreases while the surface pressure increases. But, it doesn't really matter how cute you think a molecule is. Sometimes the molecule will have all the electrochemical properties that we want, like this hydrophobe here, but it will not really form a film. You see, we decrease the average area very much, but we never really observe an increased surface pressure. What that means is molecules are tumbling on top of each other. They are not really forming an organized film. What is the point? Well, the point is that this molecule is useless for everything else that we want to do here. Uh, in spite of the fact that it costed probably six 
months to a year of Lanka's research time. This AFI file, uh, on the other hand, behaves quite differently. You see it picks up quickly, increases the surface, and it's showing that it's forming a, a, a fairly good film that at some point these molecules are so close to each other that they start folding, they start breaking. And this is called the collapse of your monolayer. Uh, when a monolayer collapses, again, it's not a monolayer anymore, it's all over the place. So what we do then is we try to understand what is the best surface pressure that we have along this compression isotherm that will allow us to get the best film, the most homogeneous film, so that we can build a device out of that. The first thing that we do, we use a technique that is called infrared reflection absorbance spectroscopy. It's a fancy name, but it's basically infrared spectroscopy. Okay. The difference is that because of the setup of the instrument that we have, we can check the infrared of thin layers opposite to, for example, the infrared of bulk samples, like regular infrared would do. Why do we do that? We do it because if we compare the bulk infrared of the compound with the iris infrared spectrum of the film, in spite of the fact that this one here is pointing up, this one is pointing down, the spectra are identical, right? We can find this peak is here, this peak is there, this peak is there, this peak is there. Some peaks change a little bit because in KBR you have a random orientation of molecules, in the film you have all of them like in one specific position. And, and some of these peaks don't really, uh, we don't really care if they look slightly different or if they split into two minor peaks. But some new peaks like this one here says, Man, something happened there, something has changed and we need to be very careful. What that means is this peak is associated with an imi. So when we deposit this molecule on water and we deposit from water to a solid substrate, the compound actually in presence of oxygen goes from an amine to an imine. This could be the end of this discussion, but fortunately we had characterized both the amine and the imine, and we know that their redox properties are pretty much the same. So we are good to go. The next thing that we do is we use atomic force microscopy to take snapshots at different surface pressures along the compression. So at a low surface pressure, that means molecules have a very large area of about 200 square angstroms based as pinholes in the film. What happens? If we build a, a device, we will have short circuits. No good. We try then at 25 and at 30 and things get better, but not quite good yet. At around 33%, this is the most homogeneous film that we get. And if we go further up, we end up seeing that we don't have a monolayer anymore, not a film one molecule thick, but we have multiple layers and the layers are not organized and they look pretty messy. Therefore, we don't wanna go that route. What we did was we took this surface pressure and we use this surface pressure of 33 millinewtons per meter to build our devices. How do we build these devices? Very funny, very good stuff. Uh, keep in mind that we're using two gold electrodes so that there is a considerable cost associated with all of these instruments. What we do is we deposit the film, that is this thing that looks like a chocolate here, this film is deposited on a bottom electrode that is a gold electrode. And then we put this thing on a chamber. We, we let this thing dry. We let all the water be removed. It's, it's a dry film. 
And we bring this film onto a uh, chamber in which things are evacuated and we deposit gold using a uh, cold gold method or uh, sputtering. And we use that with a mask and the mask allows us to divide the top electrode in all of these small little electrodes in here. And each of these electrodes is seen in AFM right here. So this little uh, white writing that possibly you can't read says 10 micrometers. What means this is about 100 to 150 micrometers in length. So it's a pretty small uh, device. And we have 16 of these devices per assembly. And every time that we do one of these assemblies, about seven to 10 of them will be working properly. Um, 10 to 12, 10 to 13 sometimes don't work. They have short circuits. The film is peeling off. There's some contaminant in there, something. That means we need to do each of these experiments several times so that we have statistically meaningful data. The next thing that we do, and that's where really things get really interesting, we use a Kitely signatone instrument that uses micro electrodes and we put electrodes right at the top of the device and close the circuit. And when we do that, we measure the behavior, the electrical behavior of these devices, junctions. For this compound here, um, Lanka observed exactly the kind of curve that we want to see. This curve shows that the asymmetric molecule, the asymmetric surfactant, will conduct electrons in one direction, but when we change the voltage, nothing, absolutely nothing happens. And this is beautiful. This is like poetry. This was a great day in the lab, and this ended up being uh, published in Angevante Chemie. We are very proud of that. And initially, what we suggested is the following. Sure, this is asymmetric mechanism. We are transporting one electron through the LUMO of this molecule here, the acceptor of this molecule here. So electron hops to the empty orbital and from there it goes to the other electrode. Um, the HOMO is not really involved. It's far away in energy. The top need here is that we match the energies of the electrode, biased electrode, the tunneling orbital and the other electrode. And we will discuss more about that in a second. However, there's a little problem in there. The acceptor is supposed to be the LUMO, but if the acceptor is metal-based and this is iron, this is a high spin iron compound. That means we don't have any LUMOs low in energy. What we have is actually SOMOs. We're not talking about lowest unoccupied, so empty molecular orbitals. We are talking about singly occupied molecular orbitals. And that complicates things considerably. That was one of the first times that we had, that anybody had actually observed this kind of process. A few years later, I found a theoretical paper saying that that would be possible, but that was really buried in a physics journal and not available to most chemists. And then that became our goal. Let's explain how this thing works. Before that, remember that I told you Metzger was the first person to uh, demonstrate experimentally that we would, uh, that, that, that rectification was possible. This field is pretty competitive. And whenever, rather than criticizing somebody else's work, what you do in this field is you come to somebody, to some young Turk that tries to be entering in this field and you say, would you mind if I verify and validate your data? And of course that coming from Metzger is pretty intimidate, intimidating, uh, but we agreed on that. And in fact, he ran a lot of experiments with similar molecules than we have. And he came with the 
conclusion that rectification is an excellent agreement with our results. So we have rectification. The behavior has been validated by one of the founding fathers of the field, and we were ready to, to move on. In another uh, collaboration, we worked with ISA brand in Germany to show that all of these molecules, they have a certain tilt. And when we reduce iron three to iron two, this molecule dramatically changes position. When we go back to iron three, it goes back to that starting position. So the more we moved on using even more advanced and sophisticated methods, the more we understand how this electron transport is happening. But we hadn't yet solved the problem of how this electron is transported. And for that, we came with a very beautiful chemical experiment. Let's synthesize two amphiphiles. One of them is an iron compound. And this iron compound is a 3D5 high spin. So each of these 5D orbitals will have one electron. And then any of these electrons might be the tunneling, any of these orbitals might be the tunneling orbital that makes electrons go in a certain direction. It is very interesting because we have spin limitations in here. If we have all spin up microstate, the incoming electron needs to be spin down. And that's something that we are still trying to do to understand how to quantify. But in this experiment here, we said, if this is the case, we will have conduction, we will have electron transport in any of these orbitals, possibly the lowest one. If the lowest one has an energy that is comparable to the Fermi level of, of the electrodes. So the Fermi level or the work function is the energy by which all of those electrons, free electrons in copper, in gold, in silver, in any metal, all of those electrons are being um, conducted. So it's the, it's the conduction band, so to say. If we use copper, on the other hand, copper is a 3D9 system. That means that all but one of these orbitals is completely filled. So unless we start putting a lot of energy there, we are not removing any of these electrons. And the only orbital that can work as the tunneling orbital would be the highest in energy, that is the dx squared minus y squared. So hypothesis, if we are having electron transport through SOMO, we should see in this new compound, we removed one of the phenolates just to simplify the synthesis. And we shouldn't see rectification in this copper compound. So what did we do? Before I show that to you, I need to tell you, how do we talk energies? Keep in mind, when we take a CV, a cyclic voltammogram, we are getting potentials in volts. When we are talking about Fermi levels, band gaps, et cetera, et cetera, we are using solid state potentials given in electron volts. So we need to convert these two units so that we can talk apples and apples. Okay, and if we don't do that, we definitely would have apples and oranges. They, they are completely different things. So we use some uh, equations that uh, have been, uh, that are available in the literature. And we try to find the potential of affinity that relates to the reduction. And that gives us the energy of the LUMO or the SOMO. In our case for iron three here, the energy of the SOMO. And then we try to use the potential for ionization that relates to the oxidation or the energy of the HOMO. In this case, the phenolate to phenoxyl oxidation. And we convert those voltages into 
electron volts. And now we can compare that to the Fermi levels or the work function of the electrode. For gold that we use, this is 5.1 electron volts in vacuum. Forget about the signs, it's all in vacuum. Uh, signs don't really matter much here if we keep things um, absolute. So 5.1 electron volts in vacuum. What we do then doing that calculation, we show that those orbitals for iron and for copper, they will appear at about 4.1 electron volts, therefore one electron volt between the Fermi level and the molecular orbit. And for copper, on the other hand, we need much more energy, about two electron volts, to be able to reach that semi-field or uh, semi-field singly occupied orbital. The homos, they are actually farther down here. They're not quite to scale because I wanted to show this part here. But now what we want to do is to apply a bias. And by applying a bias, we will increase the energy of these electrodes so that possibly we will increase the bias of the electrodes. We will increase somewhat the energy of these orbitals as well, so that as we apply a bias, we will change all the environments. But for electron transport to happen, we still need to have a kind of a cascade effect that the electron here occupies the, uh, the SOMO and then goes to another, or, uh, another electrode that is lower in energy. Okay, so this is what we are trying to do. Guess what happens? We do see rectification for iron that validates the idea that we are indeed using this SOMO. And this SOMO is actually a linear combination of two molecular orbitals, DXZ and DYZ. And then when we try that for copper, Remember, very high in energy, boom, nothing happens. Absolutely nothing happens. And with this experiment, I really get excited when I show this data. We have shown that we are having electron transport through SOMO orbitals. And this, this was a first. So what else? We then expanded these mechanisms. We tested quite a number of compounds. And it's always interesting, for example, this compound here with two nitro, nitro groups as substituents gives a very accessible energy. 0.7 should be a great rectifier. Uh, it doesn't work because it doesn't form films. So there again we go. But one thing that we noticed is that depending on how we actually calculate things and how we change the ligand, we can bring the HOMO closer and closer to the Fermi levels of the electrodes. And if the HOMOs are close enough, it is possible, just possible, that we will actually knock off one of those electrons, they will transfer, will form a hole, and then we would have rectification using HOMO uh, orbitals as well. There comes the Suri. Isuri, very uh, unassuming person, very calm, very composed. And she started working with some very tough problems and did it beautifully. Um, she took the iron compound that we have just described, one electron volt. She synthesized two more compounds, one with chromium, Chromium has a 3D3 electronic configuration and vanadium, vanadium-4 vanadyl, that has only one electron. So we've calculated, we've run the electrochemistry, calculated, converted the potentials and compared to gold. And what we see is the following. By itself, the mechanisms that we know, these two compounds here should not be rectifiers because chromo has the first SOMO even higher than copper, and we know that copper doesn't rectify. 
And the first lumo of the vanadyl is also very high, like copper. However, we are bringing the somo, the one metal-based electron, pretty close to the orbital Goldilocks area, the Fermi level area. And for chromium, in fact, even if the metal is out of reach, the ligand orbitals are coming pretty close to that um, electron transport area. And I will tell you what, um, all of them rectify, okay? S Isuri observed that these are rectifiers. They are not as good as iron. That means the current that they pass is smaller. And that means that the matching of the energy between orbitals and, and electrodes is not quite good, but it works. And that led us to come with explanations for that. And that is the fall. We start in the resting state, we have the SOMO vanadium electrode here, excuse me, vanadium electron in here, electrodes there. We then apply a bias, meaning we apply a potential to one of these electrodes. When the electrode increases in energy, it brings all of its surrounding, it lifts the energy of all of its surrounding too. And because that metal orbital is so close to the Fermi level, when we go up in energy for the electrode, we will bring those orbitals up too. And we will bring them just to a point in which this energy is matching with this energy, and this energy is matching with that energy, so that this electron then can be transported to the other electrode. And then there's another step that we are not showing here, that is one electron coming from the, uh, the original electrode and replenishing the ground state of the compound. So we can explain why they rectify, and this is the beauty of science. For chromium, it's even weirder because we don't use metal orbitals, we use ligand orbitals. Same principle, we lift those to a point in which we can have electric transport. And by doing that, we are doing fundamental chemistry, we are expanding coordination chemistry to a point that uh, it hasn't been done before. We are merging techniques from uh, surface uh, science with coordination science and, and expanding the field of knowledge. My very last slide is about what Samudra is doing. And Samudra didn't want to work with the five coordinate compounds. She said, well, if distortion of orbitals is important, any sort of distortion should be enough to generate electron transport. Fine, Samudra, you want to try a new ligand? Go for it. And she did. And she synthesized three new compounds. I mean, she synthesized many things, but uh, in this project here, she synthesized three new surfactants, one containing iron, one containing cobalt, one containing ruthenium. And what you see here is that for iron, we are at the very limit of what we would need to see electron transport, 1.4 electron volts. We want to have one, but this is not a five coordinate species. So we don't really know what the limit for that is. is. And then for cobalt, we see something that is very interesting. Both the um, LUMO or SOMO and the HOMO, they are very close to that energy of the electrodes. And for ruthenium is the opposite. We have very different uh, energies. What does that mean? It means that Samudra is able to see directional electron transport for iron, and that is rectification. Now, granted, see how low the current here is. It's not a great diode, 
but it's very interesting and very cool to study. And then she sees a directional electron transport for cobalt. So what that means is it goes from left to right and back from right to left. It's both ways. This is a unique thing. And then for ruthenium, it works as an insulator. So at this point, not only we can use electronic configurations to determine whether we have rectification or not, but if we change the environment around the metal, we can use metals to give different kinds of electron transport. I will stop here. I will just conclude very briefly a few things about molecular electronics. Uh, we do that because we think at some point silicon-based compon components uh, will need to be re replaced. And all that we are doing is we are trying to control electron transport in many different ways. In terms of molecular rectification, the control of this electron transport is done by making it directional. So from electrode one to electrode two, but not back. And then in terms of what we did in our group, we started with bioinorganic complexes. We have this five coordinate iron environment. We showed tunneling through metal-based MOs. So this linear combination of orbitals, whenever the energy of this orbital matches the Fermi level of the electrode. And then we show that transport is actually via SOMO, not via LUMO. And it restricts the level of current that we're going to have, but it does work. Copper did not rectify because we have a mismatch with the Fermi levels. Vanadyl and chromium show distinct mechanisms. They are not great rectifiers, but they do work. And then electronic configurations determine intensity of the current, and the electronic current determine the response in therapy systems. More important than all of this, this is a story that was built with the help of many, many talented uh, Sri Lankan students that came to Wayne State to do their PhD work. I had to use the beautiful flag of Sri Lanka at least once in this talk, and I take this very last line to do that. And once again, I want to express all of my gratitude to those students. In fact, I want to express my gratitude to all of the alumni, all of these people here that got PhD degrees and some master's degrees uh, in my group working with me, working together, generating ideas, all the bold names. These are the current groups, uh, current members of the group. All of the names in bold, they have contributed to this project in particular. This, um, I have several collaborators that helped us. And of course, a big part of my life is writing grant proposals and trying to find money to support students and support research. And these are the agencies that believe in what we are doing. With that, I will stop here and I will be very happy to address questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Verani, for sharing your inspiring work with us and the involvement and the success stories of the many students who have worked with you. And um, I'm pretty sure the students present here must have felt excited to do their postgraduate studies in a group such as yours. So um, it's time for the Q&A session. We can take a few questions from the audience. Um, I'd like to request you to unmute your mic and direct any questions you have uh, from Professor Berani. And don't be shy. Turn on your, your cameras. I want to see faces. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> that's a very interesting and inspiring lecture. Unfortunately, I don't have a camera right now, so I can't show, <laughs> no <problem. laughs> show you my face. Yeah, OK. Anyway, you are trying to, you know, working on this potential replacement of uh, silicon-based components by molecules. That's one of your targets, right? So my question is, how close are you to use this concept in practical applications? 
Okay, uh, that's a good question. And um, I remember in the beginning, I was very cautious about saying that this is really fundamental research and this is uh, one day possibly will become important. So we shouldn't hold our breaths and hope that next month we will have a molecule-based computer. I think the best comparison that I can give is the following. When Edison was trying to work on um, designing the light bulb, either by himself or, or getting, quote unquote, inspired by Tesla or, you know, several people were trying to come with the idea of converting electric current into light. And, and Edison succeeded. And one of the things that he did was he needed to find the filament so that he could have light. Well, he tested more than, uh, I think it is a thousand materials to the point that he finally decided to, to use burnt bamboo filament. And that was the first light. And later it was replaced by metals, et cetera, et cetera. What I'm trying to say is the light bulb didn't start the way it is, right? It started in a very rudimentary manner. That's where we are. We are checking, we are trying to see what is possible. And we are trying to see how far we can stretch chemistry and how much we can learn in that process. Thank you, yeah. I see. Professor Verani, uh, I have a question, two questions for you. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, so uh, I'm Ayanti from chemistry department. Uh, so I have the first question uh, actually, which follows the second one. Um, so you discuss about the high valent ion four that you said you did not observe, right? Correct. And mm -hmm. is it important for you to have high valent ion four? Uh, At the time, we wanted iron four because we were following what was known in the literature. And the literature said that either you use the LUMO of organic compounds or you use the HOMO always with organic compounds, right? So we thought if we can get to iron four, we will be able to do that using the metal. But the way things develop and the way things ended up happening, it's not really relevant for us to have iron four at this point. Yes. Uh, the next question is that uh, I was wondering uh, when in the bioinorganic point of view, uh, could you use uh, porphyrins or metalloporphyrins uh, for in this purpose if you uh, modify with the uh, uh, surfactant uh, group? I mean, you can make it amphiphilic. Uh, can you use those molecules? In fact, you can, and it has been used. Mm -hmm. uh, porphyrins were among the very first um, metal containing rectifiers, right? Yes. The problem, though, is that when you use a delocalized ring like a porphyrin, you are really using homos and lumos that are organic based. You are not yes. even touching the metal orbitals. And what we wanted to do was not to continue in the organic tradition, we wanted to actually use a, uh, the, the, the orbitals of the metal. Mm -hmm. But strictly speaking, yes, you could use um, you, you could use um, porphyrins. In fact, one of the things that we are trying to do in the group, and it's been pretty challenging, uh, I have a student called Avi Cosino, and she is trying to replace the counter ion of any coordination compound that we feel could work as a rectifier by a discrete surfactant like sterate or phosphate or SDS or you name it. And actually 
bring them onto a device. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing though, is that when we do it, we don't have the covalent attachment between the long chain and the compound. And what we see is that the complex itself starts to float in between two electrodes and we end up seeing a behavior similar to the one that Samudra saw for cobalt, that is that S-shaped sure. curve, meaning you can have current in both sides, okay. in both directions. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Professor Claudio, um, thank you very much for the lecture. It's very exciting and, and interesting. Um, I have a thank question you. about the frequency response of, of uh, uh, the gates. Do you have any idea about that? No, I don't. And that's where we are looking for a good collaboration with either engineers or, or, or physicists, uh, because we, at some point we need to go there, right? And, and I agree with you, we need to study that. It's just a matter to find the right person, the right um, instrumentation, and so that we can do that either ourselves or in terms of collaboration. I see, thank you. Are there any more questions from the audience? Um, Professor Berani, uh, this is Dakshika. Dakshika, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Nice to see you and I'm happy to hear your voice. And the chemistry that we discussed in the group, once again, comes back to me. <laughs> Reminds me <laughs> that I heard. <laughs> um, good. So, uh, the question I have is, uh, now we have studied phenolate compounds. So when you think about a uh, catechol and amino catechol ligands based, based compounds, um, do you think there will be any uh, progress towards rectification, sir? current rectification? The, the Yes. Yeah, so the, the, the question is some of the some of the compounds. By the way, that Shika was absolutely gracious when uh, Samudra was studying some of the compounds that she had synthesized before, and she had gotten a crystal structure that, of course, is not easy to get. And when uh, we thought about asking for um, some more information about those compounds. Dr. Shika was absolutely gracious and she sent the crystal structure and she made things available. And of course she will be part of that paper whenever that comes, but um, she didn't do that because she thought she would be part of the paper. She actually did that because she's a wonderful person. And, and I really appreciate that Dr. Shika, by the way, very publicly saying that. Um, going back to your question, we have some compounds that have catechols. Catechols can be oxidized even more easily than phenolates. Uh, we are studying those compounds now. We have a ruthenium catechol compound that works as a rectifier. The big challenge that is being very complicated is that we don't know quite yet what, who is being reduced in there. Is it the ruthenium? Is it the catechol? Gut feeling, I'm saying it is the catechol. And then we are working with uh, Elena Yakubikova in North Carolina, trying to do a lot of high level DFT data so that we can propose something and even at that level, comparing to our experimental data, uh, we see it's pretty much a split. It is, it, it, it's very difficult to say what is the preferential pathway. And by not knowing that, it makes it difficult for us to come with a final statement. You know, it's like this compound behaves in this way. But we will get there, hopefully. And if that works well, uh, then the next question is, if the catechol can be a good uh, channel to transport the electrons, do we want to explore it further or do we want to stay working with metals? 
to be determined. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Good to see you. Since we're running a little behind with time, uh, we'll have to conclude this session. So um, thank you, audience, for your questions and uh, Professor Verani for your answers. Um, with that, uh, we come to the end of today's webinar, and uh, I invite uh, I invite Kumudita Ratnayaka to deliver the word of thanks. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. I've been honored with the privilege of presenting the vote of thanks on behalf of the Department of Chemistry of University of Peradeniya and members of the INSPIRE team. First, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Professor Claudio Verin for accepting the invitation and spending his valuable time sharing his comprehensive knowledge on the latest research activities in the field of electrometallosis of junctions. This instructive webinar was very stimulating and I'm confident many of our audience would have found it inspirational and would be excited with the prospect of engaging in these enthralling research activities. Thank you, Professor Claudio Verri, for your inspirational webinar on this Thursday evening. Next, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to Professor Mana Devi Ganahin, Head of the Department of Chemistry, for inviting and hosting the guest speaker on the Inspire stage. Furthermore, your support and guidance are valuable in bringing this webinar to a successful conclusion. In addition, I would like to thank the attendees for being with us this evening. I am sure you would have found this webinar very informative and inspirational in shaping your academic future. Thank you very much again, Professor Verani, for the splendid webinar delivered today at the SPICE stage. And I'd like to invite you to join the Meet Speaker event with the other link provided. Finally, I would like to invite all of you to our next webinar, which will be held as a joint Arcana Inspiration Pro Inspire program on the Friday, 26th of November at 7 p.m. onwards. Thank you, everyone. Have a pleasant evening. I'm Peter D. Almeida, and I'm very happy to be invited by the Department of Chemistry, University of Peradeniya, to speak on your joint platform, Arcana and Inspire. So if you dare to adventure, please join and spend 60 minutes with us on the 26th of November at 7 p.m. I'll see you there.